Hi, and welcome to that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Schmiederer. In Viking times, a thing was a gathering, a place where leaders and warriors could meet and talk. In the 21st century, our thing is a virtual place where Viking academics and enthusiasts from around the world can come together to share knowledge. So hold on to your helmets as we learn more about Vikings on that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. Today we're joined by Professor Judith Jesch, Professor of Viking Studies at the University of Nottingham and author of numerous articles and books on the Vikings, including a book called Women in the Viking Age. Today she's going to be talking with us about just that, Viking women. Hi Judith, thank you so much for being with us today. Hello. So I figure we'll start with something basic. First of all, for a lot of people, the term Viking women may sound a bit like an oxymoron. The image of Vikings in popular culture tends to skew more towards depictions of men. How accurate is that conception of Vikings and um, what roles did women typically occupy in the Viking age? Okay, well, there's a lot of things to unpick in your question. Um, I mean, the first, the first thing I would say is that actually in popular culture, there's been an increasing interest in uh, Viking women, uh, exactly as you might call them. So that's something that's changed in the last 10 years or so. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that question in a moment, I think. Um, in terms of the oxymoron, well, um, a lot depends on what you think the word Viking means, and there, there are different ways of understanding that word. Um, I generally prefer to think either of Vikings generally without specifying whether they're male or female, um, and they can be many different things, or just talk about the Viking Age, which is a, a particular period from the 8th to the 11th century and then people did things in that historical period that we that we call the Viking Age. So depending on how you define all of those will depend on, on whether you think uh, Viking women are an oxymoron. Um, the more specific question you asked um, is I think a bit easier to answer, um, although it depends again on how you define Vikings and what you're really talking about. It's, it really is a problem, you know, what, what exactly do you mean by Vikings? Because it's a 300 years of history uh, geographically. It could cover from uh, Russia in the East to North America in the West and, and probably different things went on in different places. Um, but in terms of, of women's roles, I mean, most people lived either a very agricultural life or, or they uh, lived in what we might call towns or at very least trading centers where they engaged in trade and craft or they might have been uh, migrating to other places and women would play a part in all of those enterprises. And I think the way I like to see it is, is that um, most of those enterprises were common. Um, People, you know, people did them in families or in groups, and certainly the families and often the groups would include women. Now, within those families and groups, women might have different roles. So, um, on a farm, uh, women would be more tending to work inside the household, um, but they could. They they did also have to get involved. All hands had to be on deck at harvest time and things like that. Um, in craft and trade, women played a role in, in a, what might be seen as a small family business, perhaps. Um, even the raiding armies, there is evidence that uh, some of those had women and children with them, so that they were kind of mobile communities rather than armies, exactly uh, as we imagine them. So I think women were involved in most of the things that went on in the Viking Age, um, but within those I think the gender roles were very often fairly strictly uh, divided. Amazing. That's that's a perfect answer. Thank you. For our next question, uh, there tends to be two opposing images when people think of women in the Viking Age. They're either stereotypically medieval subservient housewives or they're liberated feminists with land and property running around divorcing their husbands. Where do these two interpretations tend to come from and is either of them accurate? <laughs> where do they come from? Um, 
I would say the first one comes from the 1950s and the second one from the 1970s. <laughs> Um, the, the, idea, the idea of the subservient housewife is, you know, I, I don't quite remember the 1950s, but we know enough about it to know that, 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 that you know, that, that is very much the era of, you know, women getting new hoovers and washing machines and things, and, and the housewife was a very specific kind of person. I think being a housewife in the Viking Age was a completely different matter. Um, you So... It, you, as a housewife in the Viking age, you not only had to do the cooking, the cleaning, the bringing up of the children, you also had to produce the food uh, from uh, the animals and plants that was, were grown on the farm before you could cook it. You had to actually make the clothing uh, that you clothed people in before, before you, you had to wash their clothing. So, you know, they, they would have to spin the wool and weave it in, into cloth. They would have to make linen, um, from flax, which is a very, very uh, demanding, physically demanding job. So all of those things had to be done. Most of those things were done by women. Um, and depending on the size of the household, um, I suppose in a very small household, a poor woman would have to do it all by herself. Uh, in larger households, the housewife would be the mistress of the household, the person in charge of other women uh, doing all, all these jobs. Um, so not really a subservient role at all, but a, a really quite fundamental one to the survival of the household. The idea of uh, Viking women as liberated feminists who could own land and property and divorce their husbands, certainly um, there is evidence that women could own land and property. Uh, there is evidence that they could divorce their husbands. How common this was is not very clear, and I suspect it varied enormously um, in different places and different times. Uh, and I don't think the idea of being a feminist was just not a, a concept that people had in the, in the Viking Age. I think it was very definitely a patriarchal society. I think there's no doubt about that. But within uh, that patriarchal society, women did have their role. Uh, they did have respect. Um, and I think um, th there, was, uh, there were various things they could do. Um, in terms of their possibilities as human beings, I would say that that uh, the options open to them were at least as much dependent on the social class that they were born into as uh, their gender. So uh, high status women really had quite a lot of possibilities and options, lower status women had none really. So I think um, you, you mustn't just see it as a matter of gender, but also as a matter of uh, social class, that the, the society was really quite divided in that way. So the answer to your question, Miranda, is that neither of those interpretations is accurate. Um, and the truth, as usual, I'm afraid, is, is really quite complicated. You know, going towards the, the more liberated feminist side of things, um, shield maidens have taken on a life of their own in popular culture lately, and a lot of burials have recently been reinterpreted as Viking warrior women. Do you think these burials are evidence of mythological shield maidens, or is this just a case of people seeing what they want to see? Okay, I think there, there are two different uh, things I want to say in answer to that question. Uh, the first one is to do with uh, shield maidens. Actually, I've literally just finished writing an article about shield maidens, and I would like to argue that shield maidens is a term we should reserve for what you call mythological, or I would say possibly literary imagined figures. And uh, in this article, which hasn't been published yet, I argue that the, the shield maidens of much of Old Norse literature uh, are derived from uh, exposure to the idea of Amazons um, from you know, classical literature. So they're not a, a real phenomenon in any sense. They're a literary imagined phenomenon. Um, whereas when archeologists are interpreting burials, they're not really talking about shield maidens. They're talking about, they're suggesting that the women in those burials were warriors. Um, now I'd say two things there. One is that I, I wouldn't agree that a lot of burials have recently been reinterpreted as Viking warrior women. Uh, there's one a very 
well-known case um, in Birka, and then there are a few others which are perhaps less clear. Um, so it, it's not a widespread phenomenon, uh, not yet, although I know some archaeologists are working or were beavering away on, on burials to see if they can find more warrior women, because uh, they think that um, perhaps we've gone wrong in interpreting any burial with weapons as that of a warrior. Now, of course, uh, I would argue that the difficulty is, is what do you mean by a warrior? Um, just because a woman has been buried with weapons, does that necessarily mean uh, she was a warrior? And what, what is a warrior? I think in the period we're talking about, uh, a lot of men certainly uh, were armed and able to use weapons without necessarily being full-time paid warriors that you just, you know, especially if you were a merchant or something, you had to defend yourself uh, and, and your wares. So there, there could be other reasons for uh, why women are buried with weapons. And then, of course, the identification of the skeletons as female, because the, the, the basic problem here is that you have a burial with a skeleton um, and then you have uh, grave goods and it's the grave goods that supposedly tell you something about the person buried uh, there. And then in order to identify that skeleton as male or female, you can use a variety of techniques, uh, osteology or ancient DNA, um, all of which uh, are good indicators, but not necessarily 100% certain. So, and then that raises the question, uh, did those items in the grave belong to that person or were there other possible reasons uh, for putting them in there? And this is the kind of thing archeologists have been discussing for a long time and, and they have a variety of opinions about it. It's a matter of interpretation, I think. I'm, I'm not actually an archeologist, so I wouldn't want to comment on the, on the more technical side of what archaeologists are finding in these graves, but then once you've got the facts comes the interpretation, and it, it's the interpretation that I think everyone can get involved in, in a discussion of. Um, what does it mean uh, if a skeleton that the scientists tell us is female or was female when she was alive uh, is buried with weapons, and what kind of weapons? Um, a sword, I think, is actually quite uh, an unusual feature and as normally we would uh, in our traditional interpretations expect uh, swords to be buried with men it's it's the kind of quintessential male weapon but then there are other kinds of weapons there's bows and arrows and axes uh, which might have other purposes than just being a warrior uh, you might a uh, bow and arrow might be used in hunting and we do know that aristocratic women liked to go hunting uh, an axe might be a uh, the housewife's most useful tool when she needed to go out and get firewood uh, to do the cooking. <laughs> um, so again, um, I think there's lots of interesting questions to be discussed uh, about these, and, and I look forward to reading more of uh, the archaeologists' archaeologists reinterpretations of some of these burials. Amazing. Thank you. You've done a great deal of work uh, translating and interpreting sagas. How useful would you say that sagas are as a historical source when discussing the roles of women in the Viking Age? The short answer is very useful, <laughs> but here comes the much longer answer. <laughs> um, first of all, there is, uh, again, uh, I, I, I sorry to bang on always about questions of definition, but I think it's quite important. There what, what do you mean by sagas? Uh, well, sagas are long prose narratives composed mainly in Iceland in the third, from the 12th century onwards. Um, and some of them are highly fic fictional. Some of them tend more uh, to seem historical. Um, and there are many sub genres of sagas and many of those sub genres are not really relevant to what we're talking about now. So there was this great flowering of uh, prose narrative literature in medieval Iceland, basically. And Iceland, uh, as you know, um, came into being as a result of the Viking Age. So people in the Viking Age um, emigrated to this otherwise uninhabited island. Um, and when they uh, 
uh, a couple hundred years later became Christian uh, and learned to write um, the Latin alphabet and to write manuscripts, then they developed a, a very large and complex uh, literature, which is one of the glories of wor world literature. And these many of these texts are uh, just wonderful literary texts. And it's easy, and many people do, just to think of them as literary texts and not worry too much about uh, what they're actually about. However, what I find interesting is that several of the subgenres, um, particularly what we call the sagas of Icelanders and the sagas of kings, um, and there are quite a lot of those. I mean, there are 40 sagas of Icelanders and then there are uh, associated short stories as well, um, are set in the Viking age. So they're set in a period that by the time these sagas were written is in the past, it's, it's history. And yet that seems to be what the medieval Icelanders were absolutely fascinated by is their history really. Uh, a lot of the sagas of Icelanders uh, start with the main characters arriving in Iceland in, in the settlement period. Um, the king sagas tell us about uh, the, the Viking Age kings of Norway and Denmark. Um, some of these, particularly the king sagas, are based on poetry that we think uh, was actually composed uh, in an oral context in the Viking Age and then preserved until um, the saga writers uh, decided to use it as, as a kind of source uh, for their sagas. So the exploits of kings were preserved in this uh, poetry and then the sagas were written around that poetry, but also citing that poetry. So you could, in that case, you could distinguish between uh, the poetry, um, which is, I would argue, a source from the Viking Age itself, and then the sagas, which take some information from the poetry, but build a narrative around that. Um, and as I said, there, there, as well as the sagas, there's also two very fascinating works of history, uh, the Landnama book, which is the book of settlements, which describes the settlement of Iceland. It's a kind of catalog of 400 plus of the first settlers uh, of Iceland and their family relationships and where they settled. And then there's a very well-known book, the Eastlendinger book, the book of the Icelanders, uh, is one of the earliest works of Icelandic literature, which also describes the settlement and earliest history of the island of Iceland. So all of these put together show that there was, there was a lot of knowledge about the Viking Age past in medieval Iceland. Some of it derived from poetry, some of it probably derived from genealogies. The Icelanders were very keen on knowing who their ancestors were. Um, and then there was also this great flowering of writing uh, sagas, prose narratives. And somehow all this comes together and creates the sagas. And somewhere in there, <laughs> there is uh, what they thought happened in the past. And some of that could be true. <laughs> I think, you know, I think they had quite good information, but they also we're very good at telling stories. And once you start telling a story, then, you know, you perhaps move away a little bit from what actually happened. Um, so what I would say uh, is two things. First of all, I wouldn't ever totally dismiss anything they say in the sagas, because after all, they're a lot closer to the Viking Age than we are. <laughs> um, then I think we also, I think it's, it's a rather specialist thing. Uh, you need to sit down with these texts. And I've previously argued for what I call a kind of archaeology of the text. You need to work out what is the bit that the 13th century author is kind of adding to his sources, uh, what bit might come from his sources. Um, and so you can't just sit down and read a saga in translation and use that as evidence for the Viking Age, as, as I'm afraid quite a lot of <laughs> um, people do. They think, oh yes, well, I've read a saga, so I know what happens in the Viking Age. It's not that simple. I think you need uh, specialist training. You need to know the manuscript background. You need to read the sagas in the original language. You need to have an understanding of how these texts developed this thing that I've called the archeology span of the text. So, um, Having done all that, well, 
how does that uh, relate to women? Um, well, <laughs> um, a lot of the sagas do focus on male uh, activity, basically. Um, and this goes back to what I said earlier about the patriarchy. Um, but nevertheless, there are female characters in the saga. Sometimes these female characters uh, seem to be presented in a slightly misogynistic way, which uh, might come down to uh, the authors of these sagas. Um, but at the same time, they do exist. And again, just thinking back to Iceland, um, I mean, Iceland was uninhabited and uh, if only male Vikings had gone there, then there would be no people living there today. <laughs> um, the sort of women are kind of fundamental to the settlement of Iceland. They may or may not have been involved in uh, writing uh, these sagas or reading them or having them read to them uh, is, is less clear. Although the we kind of imagine, um, although the sagas are written in manuscripts, people didn't really sit huddled up in a corner with a manuscript and, a, and an apple um, reading the sagas, um, they, they probably had them read to them. So one person would read out to a larger group of people. And this might have happened in the larger farmsteads um, but of Iceland, but it could also have happened in, in monasteries. And we don't know exactly where this happened. So um, I'm not sure women had much input into what the sagas actually say. Um, but they are there. There are even, when I was talking earlier about poetry, there's even a few uh, poems by or about uh, women, um, wh which are really quite interesting. So um, I think with careful study and using the right kinds of sagas, uh, you can say things about uh, women in the Viking Age. Um, Amazing, thank you. That was a very thorough answer. I really appreciate that what some of the problems might be with applying our modern understanding of sex and gender to historical men and women? <laughs> um, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, certainly in my lifetime, uh, people, uh, people's approaches to sex and gender have changed in, in, in terms of how we study the past. I mean, when I published Women in the Viking Age exactly 30 years ago, <laughs> um, it was very much a case of just trying to persuade people that women actually existed in the Viking Age. <laughs> um, whereas the at the moment, uh, younger scholars in particular, but all kinds of scholars are more interested in, well, what is the nature of sex and gender in the Viking Age? Um, and I suppose I would I start from the idea that certainly sex and gender is a fundamental aspect of the human condition that every person, it affects everybody, whether you subscribe to a traditional binary division or whether you uh, think in a more fluid uh, kind of non-binary way, either way, you're still thinking about these things. What I would say is that, um, and if we think of sex and gender more as a continuum than as a, a binary. I think that knowledge is something that has uh, come to us uh, with uh, a better scientific understanding of human beings and their bodies. Um, I tend to think that uh, the Viking, and now there, there are two things, I mean, uh, the social norms that people subscribe to in the Viking age, and then there's what people felt and could imagine. And uh, the human imagination is a wonderful thing. People can imagine all kinds of things. So people could imagine uh, non-binary situations and transgressing uh, boundaries of sex and gender. And, and there's a lot of evidence in some of the poetry and the stories that they were interested in those matters. Whether that makes uh, the Vikings queer, uh, as some people are arguing, I, I think is, is, is a bit more difficult to argue. I think there is evidence that the social norms uh, were certainly very uh, binary. Um, and the evidence for that uh, comes in various ways. Um, for example, the naming system. This is something that isn't often mentioned. Uh, the Old Norse language is a language that has grammatical gender. So, uh, so all personal names 
are grammatically either masculine or feminine. And as far as we can tell, um, men had names that were grammatically masculine and women had names that were grammatically feminine. And I think that that's such a basic division there um, that that reflects either reflects or perhaps even uh, creates uh, the social norm that you're either a man or a woman. But there are, there are other signs, obviously, um, the laws, uh, for example, this is very interesting law in the Icelandic law code. Uh, of course, the trouble with laws, you never know whether they were actually enforced. Do they reflect something real or is it just um, somebody's idea of what people ought to be doing? But there seems to be a law against people wearing clothing appropriate to the other gender. Um, and, and it's kind of described in a curious way. So um, I don't know whether people, <laughs> what, what you would do if you saw a man wearing a dress or a woman wearing trousers or something, did you rush off to the assembly and, and bring a case against that person for wearing the wrong kind of clothing? And what archeology span shows us is that there are two different kinds of clothing, which we then assume are male clothing and female clothing. So I think there's a lot of evidence for the social norm being a binary division. Human imagination, though, could, uh, as in the case of the shield maidens I was talking about earlier, but also in the case of some of the gods, uh, the Norse gods like Odin and, and Loki do seem to um, transgress gender boundaries. Loki very spectacularly so, but he also transgresses other boundaries. He becomes a horse. Um, and as a uh, in having transformed uh, himself into a mare, um, actually then uh, gives ultimately gives birth to Odin's eight-legged horse Sleipnir. Um, so there's all kinds of things going on beyond just um, kind of gender uh, boundaries being transgressed. Plus, of course, there would have been individuals who might, uh, from a medical point of view, been slightly indeterminate or people who might have uh, chosen to uh, live uh, the life of another gender, but without the advantages uh, of modern trans people who have can have all kinds of medical interventions to enable that. So it's a, it's a different, um, it's both the diff different and the same as today. I mean, I think human beings are human beings and always have been so, um, but I think in terms of how people conceptualize the world, I think their everyday world they saw pretty much in a binary sort of way, but in the imaginary world of mythology and the gods and so on, uh, perhaps they were able to uh, indulge these ideas of uh, looser boundaries. Um, so I think in terms of how we study the past, I think uh, you know, our new ways of thinking in the present uh, also shed light uh, on the past, but I, I also think we have to recognize that human beings and life generally has changed over the last thousand years, so I don't think we should assume that everything uh, was how we would like it to be, and this comes back to your question about feminism and so on. Um, I do think uh, life was very different in those days, that underneath it human beings had some of the same ideas and desires and imagined similar things, but the way it actually happened in everyday life um, kind of varies enormously throughout history. And, and the interesting thing about studying the past is trying to pin down how it was uh, in that particular period. Wow, amazing. Well, thank you so much for helping us to have a, a better understanding of women in the Viking age. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was great to talk to you. Bye. You too. Bye. Thanks again, Judith. It was wonderful to have you. You can find Judith Jesh on Twitter at Judith Jesh, and you can find her book, Women in the Viking Age, in all good bookstores. Thank you for listening to That Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support That Jorvik Viking Thing, visit jorvikthing.com to make a donation as well as to find a whole horde of viking related content don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of that jorvik viking thing podcast
that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast is a production of the Jorvik Group and York Archaeological Trust, researched by Miranda Schmiederer and Ashley Fisher, with research support from Bede Rogerson and Philip Roebuck, produced by Ashley Fisher, sound designed and edited by Miranda Schmiederer.